Hello, I'm doing a book review, and the book I want to review is Midnight Days by Neil Gaiman. Now, this was published in 1999 by Vertigo, which was an imprint of DC Comics. Unfortunately, Vertigo was discontinued in 2018. Midnight Days collects five comic book stories written by Neil Gaiman and published by DC Comics, and all five of these are, of course, set within the DC universe, or at least they're set in the Vertigo universe, which I know the Vertigo universe is technically the DC universe, but I think later on it kind of got retconned into its own continuity, and truth be told, I kind of like to consider stuff like Neil Gaiman's Sandman, or Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, or the Lucifer comics, or the Hellblazer comics as kind of being in its own timeline, separate from the mainstream DC continuity. Continuity, only because the main DC continuity to me is so ridiculously convoluted. So the first story contained in this collection is called Jack in the Green, which is actually a Swamp Thing story. Now, this was originally written in the 80s, but wasn't illustrated or published until the late 1990s. It was actually specifically published to be the first story in this collection. Now, Swamp Thing was originally created created by Len Wein and Bertie Wrightson, but Alan Moore famously took over the series in the early to mid-80s, and during his run, he completely reinvented the character and reinvented the whole Swamp Thing mythos. Now, in the earlier Swamp Thing comic, Swamp Thing was a scientist named Alec Holland who got exposed to a chemical he was working on which turned him into a humanoid plant creature. But in Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, we find out that Swamp Thing is actually a plant elemental who simply inherited Alec Holland's memories, and Alec Holland is actually long dead. And we also learn in Alan Moore's run that there have been other Swamp Things in the past. So, this story, Jack in the Green, is set in the 17th century and deals with an early incarnation of Swamp Thing, comforting a friend of his who is dying of the plague. And the story is really about this version of Swamp Thing confronting the horrors of the world. The story is very short, so there's not a whole lot to say about this one, but it is really good and would have fit right at home during Ellen Moore's run on the series. In fact, the story is actually illustrated by Stephen Pissett and John Tolibin, who illustrated most of the Swamp Thing issues during Alan Moore's run. Neil Gaiman got them to come back for this story. The next story contained in this collection is called The Brothers, and this was originally published as one of two stories that Neil Gaiman wrote for Swamp Thing Annual issue number five, which was published in 1989. And this story was illustrated by by Richard Pierre's Rainer and Mike Hoffman. Now, after Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing was over and done with, Rick Veach took over as the head writer of that series, and after Rick Veach's run, Neil Gaiman, along with Jamie Delano, were supposed to take over as the head writers of this series, and this story was meant to be the first issue of what was going to be Neil Gaiman and Jamie Delano's run, but unfortunately Unfortunately, things didn't really work out the way they wanted it to, so this ended up being more of a standalone story. This story features the character of Brother Power the Geek, who was originally created by Joe Simon and first appeared in a short-lived comic book series in the late 60s that I think only ran for like two issues before it was cancelled. Basically, Brother Power was a rag doll that was struck by lightning and came to life and ended up running for Congress. And in the beginning of the story, we follow Chester and Liz, who are major allies of Swamp Thing, and they find a flyer for Brother Power, and Chester's like, I wonder whatever happened to him, and Liz is all like, you realize that wasn't real, right? That was all some joke, and Chester insists that Brother Power was real, and it turns out that Chester was right. 
It turns out that Brother Power was launched into space years earlier, but now his spaceship has come crashing down to Earth, specifically in Tampa, Florida, where it causes a lot of damage. And in this story, it's revealed that Brother Power is, in essence, kind of a similar creature to that of Swamp Thing. He is an elemental, only he's not a plant elemental. Instead of making his body from plants, he makes his body from man-made objects like usually like fabrics and stuff like that but he can also build bodies from steel and concrete and this is becoming a major headache for the government so the government contacts and in essence threatens Abby to get them to help them take care of this problem because they realize that Brother Power is a similar creature to that of Swamp Thing and a lot of the story really focuses on Chester and him trying to kind of come to grips with the fact that the 60s are over and in a lot of ways the counterculture movement did lose but in other ways the fight is still going on. And a lot of the story also focuses on Chester's relationship with Liz. Now, if you've read Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, you would know that before she met Chester, she was in a very toxic and very abusive relationship with this guy named Dennis, who basically kept her prisoner for several years, and she's suffering from severe PTSD because of what Dennis did to her, and Chester, while he is a good guy, He's also terrified of Liz eventually getting her life together because he's afraid that if that happens, she won't need him anymore. But this was a really good story, especially if you are a fan of the Swamp Thing comics, namely Alan Moore's run, because this really does feel like a good extension of a lot of the same themes that Alan Moore tried to touch on during his run on the Swamp Thing saga. Now, there is an appearance in this story from a Swamp Thing, but it's not Alec Holland. It's actually the same incarnation of Swamp Thing that we were introduced to in Jack in the Green. There are also appearances from other well-known DC characters like Batman and Firestorm. The next story featured in here is Shaggy God Stories, and this was also published in Swamp Thing Annual Issue 5 in 1989. And this story was also illustrated by Mike Mignola, who is the creator of Hellboy. Now, this story features the character of Jason Woodrow, or the Floronic Man, who is actually the main antagonist antagonist of the first story arc of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Now, Alan Moore did not originally create that character, but he did make Floronic Man a very complex and interesting and actually a very scary character. But the story follows the Floronic Man going through the wilderness, kind of pondering the nature of existence and pondering the relationship between humans and plants and also how plants actually play pretty significant roles in certain biblical or mythological stories. And in the story, we see Woodrow trying to reconnect and reconcile with the green, which is sort of this collective consciousness that all plants on the earth share. But this was a pretty good story, and you actually find yourself feeling really sorry for the Floronic Man by the end of it. The next story featured in the collection is Hold Me, which is actually a Hellblazer story first published in Hellblazer issue 27 in 1989. The story was also illustrated by Dave McKean. Now, I actually talked about this story already because this was later collected in Hellblazer volume 4, The Family Man, which I did a review on almost a year ago now. Now, the Hellblazer comics feature the character of John Constantine, who was originally created by Alan Moore, Stephen Pissette and John Tolibin and first appeared as a recurring character in Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing. Basically, the character is a paranormal investigator slash demon hunter slash modern-day wizard. 
basically hold me is about the ghost of this homeless man who is going around kind of accidentally killing people, but all he wants is for somebody to hold him, and Constantine has to stop this ghost, and the way he stops the ghost is really by just showing the ghost the compassion that he never got in his life. It's a very sad and haunting, but ultimately very beautiful story as well. And the story has a lot of interesting commentary really on homelessness and how these people are kind of cast aside by society. The final story collected in here is called Sandman Midnight Theater. This was also co-written by Matt Wagner and illustrated by Teddy Christensen. And this features the character of Wesley Dodds, or the Sandman, who was originally created by Gardner Fox and Burt Kreisman, and first appeared in comics from the 1930s. But this crosses over that Sandman with Neil Gaiman's Sandman series, which is completely separate from that, although ironically, the Wesley Dodds incarnation of the Sandman does actually appear in Volume 1 of Neil Gaiman's Sandman, and it's implied in that Morpheus is kind of responsible for the Gardner Fox incarnation of Sandman. Now, later on in the 80s, I think, there was another superhero called the Sandman, whose real name was Hector Hall, who ironically also appeared in Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Now, in case you're unfamiliar with Neil Gaiman's Sandman, basically Neil Gaiman's Sandman is about this being called Dream of the Endless, or Morpheus, who is essentially this godlike spirit that controls and rules over the dream world, and he's part of a group of celestial beings known as the Endless, who are implied to be even older than God himself. Now, this story, Sandman Midnight Theater, is actually set in 1939, sort of on the eve of World War II. Now, at this point in the timeline, Dream of the Endless, or Morpheus, is actually being held prisoner by a magician named Roderick Burgess, who is sort of an Aleister Crowley-like figure who used black magic to trap him. But basically, in this story, Wesley Dodds, or the 1930s incarnation of the Sandman, is investigating this mystery that leads him to the mansion of Roderick Burgess. Meanwhile, Wesley's girlfriend is trying to help a friend of hers who is sort of being blackmailed by a member of Burgess's circle. So basically, in the story, Wesley and his girlfriend and her friend are sort of infiltrating this party that Burgess is having that has a lot of, shall we say, unsavory characters, including people who are members of the Nazi party. And I'll be honest, this was probably my least favorite story in the collection. I think I would have enjoyed it more if I was more familiar with the Wesley Dodds incarnation of the Sandman. I'll be honest, I know jack shit about this character, so I was a little confused by the story, and I also thought the story was kind of slow, although as a huge fan of Neil Gaiman's Sandman, I did appreciate the appearance from Morpheus in the story, and I also liked how this does sort of explain the connection between Morpheus and Wesley Dodds a little bit more. So yeah, that was my review of Midnight Days by Neil Gaiman, and bye.